Good afternoon. Can you, can you hear me, guys? All right. Who have I worked with? Raise his hand. All right. Well, I look forward to working with all of you. Welcome to Metro. And uh, I don't know how much we can cover in one hour about heart failure, but uh, most, of the, most of the learning will go on the, on the words when you guys, when we work together. So um, just, this is just to kind of get you started. So today we're going to cover um, just a little bit of introduction about what heart failure is, uh, its um, a definition, its etiology, pathophysiology. We're going to talk about how you assess a patient with heart failure and how you, uh, most of the time, you initiate management of heart failure when they're in the hospital. It's an ongoing, it's a chronic disease, and, and whatever you initiate in the hospital is, is, is uh, going to have to be continued. Um, and then um, addressing some of the triggers and the comorbidities that come alone, uh, come alongside with the heart failure. So um, it is an uh, it is an epidemic disease. Um, um, it's a very um, a major public health burden. Uh, about so close to six million patients in the U.S. with heart failure. Uh, about half a million new cases every year, about 1.1 million hospitalizations, and uh, it's a costly disease, and, uh, and the readmission rate is, 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 is still high despite all of, uh, all of our efforts. It's not as high in Metro Health, actually. We, we've been getting gold awards uh, for the last three, four years for the lowest uh, readmission rate. So what is heart failure? It's a complex clinical syndrome that results from structural and fu or functional impairment in ventricular filling um, or ejection fraction uh, or ejection of blood resulting in congestion uh, and impairment in oxygen delivery. Just remember the two words, uh, congestion and impairment in oxygen delivery. And most of the symptoms and signs that you'll see are either congestive symptoms or symptoms related to low output state. Uh, what is acute heart failure is either a, a new onset heart failure or a rapid progression of previously compensated uh, heart failure due to acute illness, progression of the disease itself, or change in diet and medical uh, uh, and or medical regimen. Etiology, we kind of dichotomous. We always say ischemic versus non-ischemic. The non-ischemic is a very large basket and uh, you know, in it goes hereditary um, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, dilated cardiomyopathy. Some of the infiltrative diseases, amyloid, can be hereditary, uh, especially the TTR amyloid. Uh, inflammatory, we, we talk a lot about sarcoid, and it's very common here in metro health population, so always think about it. Uh, Postmyocarditis, Chagas. Syndrome is somebody coming from South America. Think about Chagas. Uh, valvular heart disease, infiltrative, iron overload, amyloid. Amyloid can be hereditary or acquired. Uh, and uh, catecholamine mediated cardiomyopathy is a common entity. The one that we see a lot of is in stress induced cardiomyopathy or Takasupo cardiomyopathy. Uh, there's tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy, PVC and left bundle branch block-induced cardiomyopathy, postpartum, and uh, congenital heart disease. And this is important because adult congenital um, heart disease patients are the, 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 the largest rapidly uh, growing population in the U.S. So a lot of uh, kids are growing to adult age, and you will see them in your clinics, patients who had uh, uh, TET repair, astrology fellow repair, patients who had, um, you know, a VSD repair, and, and now they are in their adult life and they come to your clinic. So you need to think about those. Um, so classification, we can classify them based, as I said, it's a dichotomous classification, ischemic versus non-ischemic. We can uh, classify them based on structural and clinical status. This is an important classification that's only been around for for a few years now, and I'd like you to start using it. And that's stage A, B, and C, and D. So A is any, any patient who is at risk of developing heart failure at some point. So it could be the hypertensive patients you treat in the clinic, should be the obstructive sleep apnea patient, could be diabetic patient, patient with coronary disease, 
but they don't have any structural myocardial problem yet. Stage B, when they develop structural heart problems, uh, either a low ejection fraction or diastolic dysfunction, but yet they don't have the clinical symptoms of heart failure. Once they develop the clinical symptoms, they are stage C, and that's what we see every day. And finally, when they reach the end of the rope, when they re reach the irreversible stage, that's the advanced heart failure stage, and that's stage D. That's when we will start talking about palliative care, or uh, heart transplant or, or mechanical support. Uh, the other classification is based on the functional class. Uh, fun are you all familiar with functional classes? A a one, two, three, and four for dyspnea at rest. One, no dyspnea with, uh, except for with the sternous activities and uh, two and three are in between. Uh, and you can classify them based on acuity. We, we did uh, define acute and chronic heart failure a minute ago. And then you can, um, based on chamber, uh, the chamber that's affected, RV failure, LV failure, or biventricular failure, uh, you can classify them based on systolic or diastolic, the half ref and half path. Uh, so if you have like an average patient in the clinic, the way you would present them on round is you would say, Mr. Smith had an ischemic cardiomyopathy, you, you define the etiology with a stage C acute biventricular heart failure with uh, uh, NYHA uh, functional class four. So you basically encompass all these classifications in one sentence, and that tells me exactly what they have. So this is this is how this is how we classify heart failure patients. The pathophysiology, you guys know, it's a vicious cycle. So it starts with the LV dysfunction that leads to um, leads to low cardiac output and um, and the low cardiac output will lead to neurohormonal activation uh, with the RAS system, the catecholamines, uh, 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 and the natriuretic peptide uh, system. And that neurohormonal activation will lead to uh, salt and water retention, congestive symptoms, increased impedance of the, uh, of the LV, which further cause LV remodeling and dilation. And, and so on, and the vicious cycle goes on, and the patient keeps coming in and out of the hospital with the progression of his symptoms until it uh, enters into stage D heart failure. Um, what is neurohormonal activation? You see me using that, that term a lot. Uh, it's not reflecting there, so, oh, actually it is. So, um, so neurohormonal activation is, 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 is the, we call it the bad humor bad humor in the blood, you know, the, everything goes up. The norepinephrine goes up, the uh, plasma renin activities goes up, the arginine uh, vasopressin goes up, the atrial natriuretic peptides go up, endothelin goes up, and um, this is the RAS system you're all familiar with, and the, 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 the final, the uh, big player there is the, uh, the angiotensin 1 receptors, which leads to the um, vasoconstriction, the cell growth, uh, sodium and, and water retention and congestive symptoms and a sympathetic activation. And those are the, the uh, deleterious effects of the angiotensin II that uh, we try to plot when we plot the RAS system. There's also the norepinephrine, and that has also the increased LV volume and pressure, uh, vasoconstriction, uh, the LV hypertrophy, uh, the arrhythmias that comes with it, and then finally the apoptosis of the myocardium. So how do you um, assess a patient with heart failure? Uh, basically, um, your assessment should have uh, two goals. The goal is, uh, is um, uh, three, three uh, the way you assess, you're going to have to rely on history, physical exam, and supporting diagnostic tests. But the goal of the assessment, that's what's important, is it's not only to establish the diagnosis if the patient has heart failure or not, but also the severity and how you're going to manage them, and most important, the triggers and, uh, of their acute decompensation. Uh, so if the patient has been doing well at home on their regimen and all of a sudden now they've been in the hospital two, three times, we need to kind of find what's the trigger, the, the trigger and how we can uh, uh, treat that. The congestive symptoms, uh, you know, um, congestive symptoms on the, on the left side, 
left-sided congestion will lead to the exertional dyspnea, uh, dyspnea tras, the orthopnea, and the PND. Um, uh, congestion on the right side will lead to the weight gain, the edema, the anorexia. Be careful with that. That's important because if you have congestion in the, um, in the, in the gut, uh, that causes abdominal fullness and cause anorexia. So the patient will be losing lean body weight, replacing it with water weight, and you wonder, well, the patient's weight hasn't changed. Why are they congested? Why are they in the hospital? Well, you replace good weight with a bad weight. So the weight is not a very sensitive marker to the fluid status in patient. Maybe on the short run, you admit them for three days, you lose 10 pounds, you, you congratulate yourself, you did a great job. But over a six-month period, they could be replacing lean body weight with water weight. And so, uh, so you have to rely on your exam and other, other tools to know if they are congested or not. Then the low output symptoms, and those are important. You know, um, when, when the patient comes with low output, you don't want to learn that they have a low output three, four days into their hospitalization when they haven't responded to the furosemide drip and they're not losing weight and the blood pressure is low. Um, oftentimes that's what ends up doing, and that's when we do a right heart catheterization and find out they have low output. But there are some, some hints. You know, the patient is fatigued all the time, uh, the in intolerant to exertion, mental status changes, you talk to them and they fall asleep in the middle of the conversation. Um, anorexia is one of them. Um, abdominal angina or abdominal pain, especially in young people, they feel every time they eat, they get discomfort. So these are all, all symptoms. cold extremities. You shake their hands and, and it's cold. Uh, so you always want to think about uh, low output state. And then there are the symptoms that I could identify the trigger for you. Chest pain, they could be having uh, um, an angina or ischemia that's causing the trigger. Uh, palpitations, uh, they could be ha going in and out of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. That could be the trigger. Uh, some, some of them don't feel the ICD shock. So they could be getting ventricular arrhythmia and getting shocks, but they don't feel it, especially if it happens at sleep and during sleep. So, so if they have a device, ask, ask the electrophysiology uh, service to come and interrogate their device. They could be coming in anemic or, you know, could be having an, an ac ac acute infection. All these uh, symptoms or tr uh, hints that, you know, could identify the trigger for you. On exam, you want to look for uh, signs that, uh, that reflects uh, uh, elevated filling pressures or congestion, elevated jugular venous pressure, S3 gallop on exam, uh, on auscultation, uh, hepatojugular reflux, ascites, edema. Uh, so congestive, congestive signs are easy to, to identify, uh, but other things, you, you could identify enlargement if you have displacement of, of the apical impulse. They could be having cardiomegaly. Uh, a new murmur that wasn't there could tell you they have a functional mitral regurgitation because now the LV has enlarged um, uh, or tricuspid regurgitation. So a new murmur uh, and the low output, we talked about the cold extremities, the altered mental status changes, the diminished pulse pressure. You know, they used to have a pressure of 120 over 80. Now they have a blood pressure of 110 over 100 or 100 over 95. So the two numbers start narrowing opposite to what you would see in, in sepsis or other vasodilation because they have so much vasoconstriction. Um, the jugular venous pressure, um, you know, I, I, I kind of spend a lot of time on words when you guys round with me to see how we, we, we assess that. But basically, it's not a rocket science. It's easy. The, the key is you have to see the, 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 the upper level of the pulse. You have to see it. So sometimes it's too high. It's above the, the jaw uh, angle. So if that's the case, put the patient sitting up all the way. If it's too low and you can't see it, put them down, put them almost flat and you can see it. So once you see it, then you identify that area where you see it and, and draw your horizontal line from, from where you see the, the impulse and then a vertical line to this angle of fluid here. So whatever that distance, you add the five centimeters to it and that's your jugular venous pressure in centimeter water. So uh, when we, 
when we report um, hemodynamics, invasive hemodynamics, we report them in, in millimeter mercury. So remember that it's not one to one. So if somebody is, if you estimate a, a, a jugular venous pressure of 10 centimeter wire, that's probably eight millimeter mercury. Um, this is the, the pulse that you see. You, you have to identify, or at least try to identify uh, the, the A and the B, you know, the A wave, uh, which corresponds to the atrial contraction, the B wave, it's not working, uh, that, um, you know, the V contraction, um, the, the ventricular um, contraction, especially if they have um, a tricuspid regurgitation, you will see the A and the B. Um, the, um, so once you're done with your uh, history and, and, and physical examination, what diagnostics tools you have, biomarkers, we use them a lot, but based on guidelines, uh, they are class one. Uh, they are class one uh, for uh, establishing a diagnosis of heart failure in the emergency room. If you have somebody with a dyspnea and you're not sure, to guide therapy and prior to discharge, if you want to know the patient has decongested enough or not. So you can do a BNP prior to discharge, and that's class 2A recommendations. But daily BNP is not, is not going to be helpful. Uh, chest X-ray also is, is essential to, to identify pulmonary edema, uh, vascular congestion, fluorofusion, cardiomegaly, um, and, and look, look for those pulmonary arteries, you can see, uh, you know, they can give you a hint if the patient has pulmonary hypertension. Uh, ECG will identify the uh, chamber size and will also uh, tell you if the patient has any ischemic changes or any tachy or bradyarrhythmia. Echocardiogram, um, I, read the, I put in, in red here what is um, required. It's a quality measure uh, uh, and it's um, it's a level of evidence one to get in, uh, to establish LV function in every patient with heart failure. But that doesn't mean we have to have an echo every admission. If the patient has had an, an echo within the past uh, six months to one year, then the only reason to, ch to repeat it if is if you expect that it's gonna change your management. If, if, if you're hearing a new murmur, if you think uh, the patient might be ischemic and looking for wall motion abnormalities. So you have to have a reason other than establishing LV ejection fraction to repeat the echo. But what does the echo tell us? It tells us more than just the EF. Uh, tell us about the right ventricle, tell us the chamber size, tell us if there is any wall motion abnormalities uh, that, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, um, tell us if there is any ischemia. Uh, it's also, um, it's a, it's a, it's a non-invasive way of getting hemodynamics. So you can establish what's the central venous pressure or the right atrial pressure, the PA pressure and the LA pressure. So you can get a lot of hemodynamic data from an echocardiogram. If the echo is not sufficient and you really need invasive hemodynamics, that's when right heart catheterization become useful. And uh, when do we do it is when our clinical assessment of hemodynamics is inadequate. We're not sure if the patient dried enough or not, especially certain patients with a large body habitus. I mean, we can't see their JVP. We can't determine if they have dried out enough or not. So that's, that's one indication. The other indication is if we expect a low output state, if we expect that the patient is not responding to diuresis because they have a low cardiac output. We talked about identifying the triggers uh, with, with ECG, with um, um, you know, looking at uh, other, other diagnostic tests. It depends on what we, we suspect. Uh, the non-cardiac triggers also as important as the tr cardiac triggers, the anemia, the acute illness, uh, COPD exacerbation, infection, etc. Psychosocial triggers, those, that's when social history is important and uh, you know, um, a, a death of a spouse, the death of, um, you know, moving into a, um, in, uh, a living, um, assisted living facilities where there is no dietary discretion. You eat what everybody else is eating. And, um, and so salt and intake might change. Depression, uh, cognitive impairments, I mean, the, if you see the regimen that I send patients on for heart failure, it just requires probably a high school education about take a few 
gain two pounds, take extra Lasix. If you, you lose weight, stop the Lasix, take this much. Uh, this, this one is BID. This other drug is once a day, that three times a day. Um, you know, it's, it's way beyond, um, you know, a simple task. And if they have a little bit of cognitive impairments, they could, they could mix things up. Once you finish your assessment with your physical exam, history, uh, and diagnostic test, I like the Stevenson's uh, profiles, uh, the, the four uh, um, boxes, and that's where you want to you wanna fit your patient in one of those boxes once you're done. So are your patients, like hopefully everybody in this room, warm and dry, basically? You have uh, good perfusion, good cardiac output, and you're not congested. Or are they like the... 80% of patients we admit to the hospital where they're warm and wet and all they need is, is more efficient diuresis, or are they um, uh, cold? They have a low output state, and they could be cold and dry, and all they're coming in is cold output state, or cold and wet where they have a low output and congested. Uh, so the, the bottom two squares belong in the, in the CICU. They belong somewhere where we can help them improve their cardiac output, the, uh, the um, left upper uh, box does not belong in the hospital, and the, uh, the other one, the warm and wet, not always means admission. Sometimes all it takes is, is um, you know, adjusting their diuretics. Um, you know, we, we, we have really cut down on a lot of admissions because not every warm and wet patient needs to be admitted to the hospital. So whether you see the patient in the clinic or in the ED, it's, it's nice when you walk out of the room to kind of put them in one of those boxes and decide what you want to do. So management. Uh, so managing heart failure is more than decongestion. I mean, unfortunately, when you're on the inpatient side, that's probably 90% of what you do is you decongest them, you diurese them. But, you know, we decongest them, we modify their neurohormonal activation. I showed you the neurohormonal activation, how high their, their uh, renin activities, their aldosterone, their uh, uh, sympathetic um, tone, and you need to bring all that down with, with, with the appropriate medications. And then um, there are other, other um, novel therapies that, uh, you know, um, that are in coming to market like uh, some other vasodilators, uh, evabridine, inotropes. And then you have to identify the triggers and the comorbidities and you have to decide the readiness for, uh, for discharge. Decongestion, so there are three ways to decongest a patient, not only diuretics. You can diurese them, you can mechanically remove their fluid, or you can vasodilate them. You know, we n never look at vasodilation as a decongestive method, but it is. If you have um, an eight ounce glass and it's filled to the prim, if you dump it into a 12 ounce glass, what's gonna happen? It's gonna, the level of the wire is gonna go down. So if you vasodilate, if you increase your intravascular space, you decongest the patient. You know, you, you patient coming in with pulmonary edema, you put them on nitroprusside or you give them IV hydralazine, and now their intravascular space is doubled, and the decongestion is going to go down. Their JVP is going to go down. Their pulmonary um, uh, uh, venous pressure uh, is going to go down, and they're going to feel a lot better. So vasodilation is a decongestive method that you should always think about, especially in systolic heart failure. So diuretics, the most, most of the diuretics that you're going to be using is loop diuretics. And there are four of them that we use a lot. Furosemide is the, the cheapest one. It's called Lasix for a reason. It lasts six hours, Lasix. So if you want to use Lasix, you can't use it once a day. You have to use it with frequent dosing. But it is the drug that's used the most. It's the cheapest. Uh, it's affordable. Uh, the, 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 these are important to remember. The PO to IV ratio is two to one. So if somebody is on Lasix, um, but, uh, if you diuresis them in the hospital on 20 of intravenous furosemide and you want to send them home, the equal oral dose would be 40, not 20. So two to one PO to IV ratio. Uh, torsemide or Demodex, uh, it's not available in IV form here. Uh, so we use it uh, a PO when the patient goes home. 
the ratio for semite to torsemite is two to one. It's better absorbed. If you have a patient with right-sided congestion, they have RV failure, probably they would absorb torsemite better than, than furosemite. So if they're not responding to oral furosemite in the clinic, switch them to torsemite, equal dose, and they will respond. Uh, bumetanide, uh, so bumetanide uh, is, is the most effective. It is longer acting. The ratio is 40 to 1 intravenously and 20 to 1, uh, sorry, 20 to 1 intravenous, 40 to 1 oral between furosemide and, and, and Bumex. So if you have somebody on uh, oral uh, furosemide 40 milligrams, the equal dose would be 1 milligram Bumex. Intravenous, 20 to 1. Um, the uh, Bumex, remember this, uh, if you're going to use it intravenously, especially the intravenous Bumex uh, drip, it causes myalgia. It causes a very severe myalgia, and I've seen it in several patients. So uh, it has nothing to do with the potassium being low or what have you. So it's just the, 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 the side effects of the drug. It doesn't happen with oral, it's happening with IV, and especially IV, uh, IV, IV drip. And um, it's a clinic acid, and we don't use that a lot, but think about it if you have somebody with severe sulfur allergy because all the other, the other loop diuretics have sulfur in them. I probably have one, only one patient I remember that is on intracrinic acid. So most of the people who have some sulfur allergy, they will still tolerate Pumex. The non-loop diuretics, uh, the proximal tubule diuretics like the acetazolamide, think about that in a patient who um, has severe metabolic alkalosis, like they have a, a chronic CO2 retention, and now you put them on loop diuretics and you make them even more metabolically alkalotic, uh, a dose or two of, um, of Diamox can, can really help a lot. So, and and it, it's synergized with loop diuretics, so use it in the hospital. But don't use it for, for alkalosis that you have caused. So if somebody is normal, acid base, and now you gave them loop diuretics and you made them alkalotic, that's just telling you you dried them out too much. Just slow down on the loop diuretics and the alkalosis will go away. So you don't use, you don't use acetazolamide to correct that. But, but if somebody has metabolic alkalosis for other reasons, it's a good drug to add. Uh, distal tubule diuretics like thiazide diuretics are also useful. Uh, they, they augment the work of the loop diuretics. So you see me using a lot of uh, metolazone uh, or, or, or chlorothiazide intravenously along with loop diuretics, and it does augment uh, uh, loop diuretics, especially in patients who are diuretics resistant. And collecting duct diuretics like the aldosterone antagonists. We use it for different reasons. We use it to antagonize the RAS system, but it also, don't forget, it is a diuretic, so it, it has some diuretic effects. So, so patients who are really um, compliant with uh, salt and water rest restriction, you may not need any loop diuretics. You might get away with just have them on spironolactone. Um, so when you use loop diuretics, remember those few um, um, important principles. So the initial dose has to be intravenous. If the patient is sick enough to be admitted to the hospital, don't treat them with PO diuretics. Use IV. And the initial dose should be equal or double the dose intravenous. Uh, so we need to teach our ED colleagues who the patient is taking 80 milligrams BID of Lasix at home, and they come in pulmonary edema, and how much Lasix you gave? 10 or 20 milligrams or uh, so you know we need to be a little more aggressive and the, the it's 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 initial it's a guessing game initially but at least have the guess a little informed based on what they take at home give them an equal dose or at, or double it it depends on how how congested they are um, adjust the dose on a daily basis your goal is to get about two to four liters and where that comes from it comes from the fact that your intravascular space is semi-fixed space, and you're basically taking out of it and hoping that it refills. You know, most of the volume of a load, when a patient comes with 20 pounds weight gain or fluid, that's not sitting in the intravascular space for you to, to remove. It's going to come from the interstitial space and from their 
uh, peritoneum and from their lower extremities. Well, that, that refilling rate is, in average, in patients with normal oncotic pressure and, and normal vascular permeability and all that, it's about two to, two to four liters. So if you go higher than that, you're basically contracting the intravascular volume. And the next day, you'll see your bicarb 40. Uh, and you have to slow down or give them fluid. If you go lower than that, you're basically just prolonging hospital stay for no reason. So always have a goal uh, of two to four liters. Sometimes we go beyond that goal uh, if we feel the patient is responsive and has good albumin and, and good renal function. So we can aim for six liters, five, six liters. But, but most of the time to be safe is, is to stay within that range of net negative about two to four liters. Um, once, so every uh, patient has a threshold when, when you know, uh, the, uh, at, at the threshold dose that you have to establish. Could be 20, could be 40. So if they responded to the threshold but they haven't achieved the two liters, the next day you don't give them a higher dose, you give them more frequent dose. Um, uh, this is the dose trial taught us that, you know, drip, or intermittent doses are the same, so you don't have to use drip on everybody. Um, their, um, the efficacy, um, um, I don't know why I duplicated that sentence, uh, do not exceed the capillary refilling rate. We talked about that. Um, and your goal when, you, when you're ready to discharge the pain, your goal is that you have normalized the total body fluid, not the intravascular uh, uh, volume. And, and you need to establish what dose of diuretics you want to send the patient on. So why we try to get away with the minimum dose of diuretics, look what diuretics do. And that's with the exception of aldosterone antagonists. Uh, all the loop diuretics, when you bring patients to the hospital, you decongest them, you make them feel better, but look what you do. You get your uh, renin uh, activities up to the roof, and you get their aldosterone up to the roof. So, you, so di, loop diuretics cause further neurohormonal activation. So that bad humor we talked about, the neurohormonal activation gets worse with loop diuretics. So the worst thing you can do for an heart, acute heart failure patient coming to the hospital is to treat them with diuretics and only diuretics. Because what you did is you just added gas to the fire. Uh, you, you immediately need to start them on their uh, um, RAS inhibition, you need to, once you, you know, decongest them, you need to start them on beta blockers because this is what's happening if you just diurese them. Um, the other method of decongesting a patient is by mechanically removing the fluid. This is the ultrafiltration. It was very popular a few years ago. Now it fell out of interest. Um, it's, it's very intriguing. It's simple. Uh, you do it through a peripheral line, actually, just like, a, uh, um, like dialysis, but you're only removing fluid. And you can remove quite a bit. You can remove 500 cc's in, 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 in a, per hour. So you can dial how much fluid you want to remove. And, uh, and it worked well. The problem is, uh, and you can do it through a peripheral line, so you don't need dialysis catheter to do it. The problem is when, what, when it was tried, it didn't pan out to be superior to, uh, to, to diuretic therapy or standard of care, actually even, even worse when it comes to creatinine. So if you look um, uh, here, uh, you see that uh, the creatinine uh, change was, was worse actually with them. So, so basically there was no difference in dyspnea score, whether you put them on, on ultrafiltration or treat them with just uh, um, aggressive dose of diuretics. Uh, there's no difference in the weight loss overall, and there was greater rise in creatinine. So right now, um, it's, it's, it's still in the guidelines that you can use it, but you probably would not see me using it much here. Um, we talk vasodilators are decongestive method. Uh, because of the reason I explained, it increases your intravascular space and lower your filling pressures. Um, and also had the added benefit, if you use it in systolic heart failure, of reducing your after load, so you improve your forward flow and your cardiac output. Um, there are venodilators, that's nitroglycerin, and um, it's, it's the oldest therapy possible for pulmonary edema, morphine, and nitroglycerin. So 
It's still effective and we use it a lot. Uh, but most important, the arteriodilator, and that's your oral hydralazine, ACE inhibitors, ARTs, uh, even certain calcium channel blockers, not, not the non-dehydropyridine, don't use diltiazem in patients with systolic heart failure, but in certain situations, you can use uh, uh, amlodipine and nifedipine. Um, the intravenous form of arteriodilator is nitroprusside, and that needs to be used in the, in the, in the ICU because it's, it's quite potent, can drop the blood pressure, but, but it does miracles sometimes by reducing your afterload and improving your cardiac output. So if you have some patients with low output, nitroprusside is the way to go. Uh, now, after you decongest the patient, or not after, at the same time while you're decongesting the patient, you're also modifying their neurohormonal activation. And, the way we do that, I mean, beta blockers to, um, to counteract the uh, sympathetic tone, uh, ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers uh, to, um, to block the angiotensin activities and then the aldosterone antagonists. And then now we have the RNA, which we'll talk about a little bit, the, uh, the neprolysin inhibitors as also uh, one of those. So beta blockers, uh, those, when, you, when we say beta blockers in, in heart failure, remember those landmark trials, the MERIT, the CPES, and the Cavernicus, and that's why those are the only three beta blockers that we use in heart failure, the carvedilol, bisoprolol, and the metoprolol succinate, not the tartrate, not the low pressor, it's the toprol excel. And those are based on these two tri three trials here that showed you know, almost a th a 30 to 40 percent mortality reduction. Um, angiotensin converting enzymes inhibitors, also remember those, those trials, the SAVE, the SALT, the consensus, and the, uh, the SALT-T, um, you know, done in different times, different ACE inhibitors. It's a class effect, so whatever ACE inhibitor you use, it will work. Um, uh, so, uh, and that's a, a pooled analysis showing the, the benefit of ACE inhibitors uh, in, in heart failure and total mortality uh, uh, and hospitalization. The angiotensin receptor blockers, not as, the evidence is not as solid as with ACE inhibitors, but if somebody who has um, intolerance to, to ACE inhibitors due to cough or due to uh, angioedema, you can consider using uh, an ARB. Uh, and they have also similar benefits. Uh, the aldosterone antagonists, Remember, the aldosterone is the final product of that RAS system, and actually aldosterone, in addition to causing retention of uh, sodium and water, it also causes excretion of potassium and magnesium, um, and, um, and that's associated with some arrhythmia, and, and collagen de deposition, so it's antifibrotic, so it reduces the remodeling and the fibrosis of the myocardium, so it's important to block the aldosterone. Uh, this is the RALS trial that uh, brought aldosterone into um, um, the guidelines uh, in, in heart failure. And um, we, um, the problem with aldosterone is this. Um, uh, it is quite potent in causing hyperkalemia. So I, it's not a patient you just met in the hospital, you send them on 25 milligrams of spironolactone and you know, go make your appointment with primary care whenever because if they don't, and if they don't get their potassium check, they might show, back, show up in the ED with a potassium of six or seven uh, and, uh, and cardiac arrest. So this is a study done after the RAS trial. So the RAS trial came out, everybody when they used spironolactone, and when they did, they found uh, actually in one observational study that the, the, the sudden spike in the hospitalization with hyperkalemia and that it, it comes at the same time when the RALS trial was released, and there was uh, death and hospitalizations with hyperkalemia. So, so if you want to use spironolactone, make sure the patient has, um, has follow-up and, and, and reliable, and he's going to follow and, and get his potassium checked. Now, the last one in the neurohormone activation is the ARNI, and it stands for angiotensin receptor neprolysin inhibition. Uh, LCZ696, now we call it Entresto. It's a combination drug of uh, 
uh, Valsartan and Sakuba Trail. So Sakuba Trail works on the one axis that we haven't talked about, the neuropeptides. So the neuropeptides are degenerated by nephrolysin, and what Sakuba Trail does is it, uh, it inhibits that degradation. So, so BNP, as we know, is, is a beta natriuretic peptides or natriuretic peptides in general, are vasodilators, uh, cause natri natriuresis, diuresis, and inhibition of growth and fibrosis, so are, are, are good stuff. So if we inhibit their degradation and increase their level, that, that's beneficial. So that's the idea. Um, so that's where this all comes from. Uh, when Sacubitril was used alone as a blood pressure drug, caused a lot of angioedema. Uh, so now that's, that's the reason we use it in combination with, uh, not with ACE inhibitor, rather with Valsartan with ARB. So that's, that's what Intrasto is. And uh, the trial that brought Intrasto into the guidelines is the Paradigm Heart Failure um, about five years ago um, and uh, shows improved uh, when it's compared with just ACE inhibitor. So we don't use Intrasto with ACE inhibitor. Be careful with that. It's, it's a very dangerous combination. So it is. ACE inhibitor versus Intrasto, and, and there was a, a both uh, survival benefit and, and the redu reduction hospitalization. Um, it's still an expensive drug, so we, 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 we kind of use it as a last resort when patient is not doing well in optimal therapy with other drugs. Uh, the one thing with Intrasto that, that is relevant to you guys is that, you remember we use BNP to diagnose heart failure? So if you are, if you are uh, um, inhibiting the nephrolysin here, what's going to happen to BNP? It's going to go sky high. So we have a, a hard stop now in EPIC that if you try to order BNP and Intrasto is, is on the list of medications, will not let you order it. But before that, we, we, we've seen, uh, you know, uh, BNP in the several thousand range uh, because the patient is on interest or not because they are in congestive heart failure. Additional therapies, the DISH trial, digoxin, used to be a very important drug in heart failure. The DISH trial showed no benefit with survival, uh, but however, there was benefit in reducing hospitalization and, 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 and uh, worsening heart failure. So sometimes we do use it, but know that, you know, there is a benefit and there is a risk you're taking. Those patients are on diuretics, their potassium level can go up and down. So if you want to use DISH, use a small dose, be careful, check DISH level, and, and keep an eye on them. Um, the hydrolazine and isosorbide uh, combination as a vasodilator, uh, that has also been tried in the AHEF trial, and there was both uh, uh, mortality and, and um, uh, mortality benefit and reduced in hospitalization. So, but that, was all, that benefit actually only showed in African-American patients. So if you want to use it in African-Americans after you have maximized them on ACE inhibitors, if you still have blood pressure room, use hydrolyzine and, 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 uh, and isosorbide. Evapridine is a new drug that uh, uh, is used also. Um, basically, it's a selective IF channel blocker in the sinoatrial node. So you can imagine if your patient is in atrial fibrillation, they're not going to benefit from evapridine. Uh, so you use it in patients who are in sinus rhythm, um, and only in those patients who, despite being on a maximum dose of beta blockers, their resting heart rate is still above uh, 70. Uh, that's supposed to be 77. So... Um, so it did show also survival benefit and reduction in hospitalization, and um, and it reduced it reduced heart rate. That's how it uh, you got the benefit. And uh, the reason we don't use it in patients who already have a, a, a heart rate below 77 is because of this subgroup analysis. So if the patient is on beta blocker and the resting heart rate is 72 or 70, you don't need evaporidine. Inotropes, uh, that's when you get to, to the patients who is cold and, uh, and, and, uh, and um, wet, uh, and you need to improve cardiac output. And there's no survival benefit. Dobutamine, merinone, whatever you want to use, there's no survival benefit. The benefit is actually enhancing diuresis, improving symptoms. Uh, so we use it sometimes to enhance diuresis in the hospital as a short term. We use it as a long-term as a palliative therapy. Patient, we send patients home on dobutamine. 
uh, or we use it as a as a, as a, um, a bridge to to decision whether we're gonna uh, send the patient for um, a heart pump or for a transplant, uh, or maybe the patient is not ready yet to go on, on hospice. So, so it can be a bridge to a decision or a bridge to advanced therapy. Uh, keep in mind it's arrhythmogenic, so if you want to use it in a patient to send them home on, make sure they have an ICD in place. Um, and uh, the one mistake that happens sometimes intentional, uh, unintentionally is your patient comes from the hospital on beta blockers, and now you find that they are in a low output state and start dovetailing and keep beta blocker going, just like driving your car with one leg on the gas and the other is on the on, on the brake. So stop beta blocker if you feel like the patient needs uh, inotrope. Um, and finally, addressing the triggers um, and the comorbidities. That that's important, especially when they're in the hospital, because that's the time you can address all these things. Um, you know, see if they are ischemic, uh, if they have any uh, angina symptoms, uh, if they have um, uh, a new ECG changes, uh, you know, you can, you can consider um, revascularization and optimizing their, their um, uh, anti-ischemic drugs to prevent ischemia. Um, arrhythmia as well, uh, bradyarrhythmia is, 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 is a, sometimes a problem. Uh, patients, we put them on beta blockers so um, one thing I failed to mention is that most of those neurohormonal blocking agents that we talked about have only been shown beneficial in 50% of heart failure patients, and those are the HEFREF. So when you come to HEFPEF, none of those medications, except for the spironolactone, have shown any benefit. So you don't need to start beta blocker on a half path patients. Actually, you might harm them more than benefit them because they don't like slow heart rate. So, so if you have a heart failure preserved ejection fraction patient, uh, uh, you don't need to have them on beta blockers uh, um, or ACE inhibitor for that matter, unless you're using it to lower their blood pressure. So you treat the blood pressure, you don't treat the, the neurohormonal uh, activation in those patients. Um, Unfortunately, nothing has panned out to be useful in those other than diuresis, improving blood pressure, prevent arrhythmia, and now, you know, the spironolactone has shown some benefits, still not, not completely agreed upon. So, uh, so if you have radioarrhythmia, they need pacing, they need CRT. Uh, if they have atrial fibrillation, you need to either rate control them or rhythm control them. And if they have ventricular arrhythmia, you can either uh, use antiarrhythmic drugs, uh, uh, place an ICD or do an ablation therapy. Non-cardiac comorbidity is important. Every patient with heart failure should have some sort of uh, a sleep evaluation because the, uh, uh, the, the, most of them fail the screening for sleep apnea. Most of them have the sleep apnea symptoms atypical, so they don't present with the typical symptoms. To, so, so try to kind of get PSG on most patients with a new onset heart failure. Uh, remember frailty and cognitive impairment, it's very common, they lose muscle mass, they lose uh, uh, brain mass, and, 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 uh, and they get more frail and more uh, uh, cognitively impaired. Uh, and that could be the reason why they're not taking their medications and they keep coming to the hospital, so that, that's important to address. Finally, discharge criteria. Uh, so, when you, you, you need to have a checklist when the patient is ready to come, otherwise it will be a revolving door. door. If, if you don't address all these issues, they're going to come back. Uh, first of all, you want to make sure the volume status is optimized or near optimized. I mean, it's okay to send a patient who's still three, four pounds above dry weight if you feel they are responding to oral diuretics and they're moving in the direction of losing, losing, uh, losing weight. Um, so... Um, the uh, body weight should be near baseline. You have to establish dry weight for them uh, to follow when they go home because when they leave the hospital, everything's going to change. You know, their diet, their uh, fluid intake. So, so if you feel that you have dried them to a dry weight, then tell them this is your dry weight. This is where you want to weigh yourself every day and keep yourself at that weight uh, and seek help if the weight starts going up. Sometimes we give them flex dosing of diuretics uh, to, to if, they able to, if they're intelligent enough to kind of take extra diuretics when they gain weight. 
So, you, so first of all, you have to establish that the volume status is optimized. Second, a pharmacotherapy is initiated or optimized. If, they never, if the new onset never been on ACE or beta blocker, you started those medications, even if it's at a low dose. Don't diurese them without having some neurohormonal blocking uh, uh, therapy on board. Um, and, uh, and then make sure they have a heart failure. Uh, clinic follow-ups where we optimize those, those therapies, you know, the, the 12 and a half milligrams metoprolol is not enough, but it's a good start. And, uh, and we aim to get it to the, uh, to the dose that is proven to be useful in clinical trials. And you want to make sure that the triggers are also addressed, whatever triggered their, their, their um, acute decompensation. And finally, that you have put some safeguard in place to prevent readmission. You made the follow-up visit uh, uh, scheduled. You addressed any psychosocial uh, situation that, that might cause them to come back to the hospital. Uh, and also, if, they, if you identify that they have moved, you remember the stages? We said stage A, B, C, D. If they move from C, which is symptomatic heart failure, to D, which is the end-stage heart failure, then you need to have addressed that. I mean, when, when we feel the patient is a stage D heart failure, which is a different talk because still there's no agreed upon definition for what's stage D, but those who have been, you know, at the end of the rope, they keep coming back, they can't tolerate any therapy, um, uh, they have a low output, whatever the case is, those patients, you, you, you either send them to palliative care because this is a terminal illness, this is, has a worse prognosis than most cancers nowadays, uh, so that you have palliative care in, in, plan, in, in place, or if they are candidates for advanced therapy, that you made the referral or you transfer them elsewhere uh, to, to, to receive that. That's it. Any questions, guys? Go ahead. Yeah, we, we, we're doing that a lot now. So basically, uh, 24 hours before discharge, we should make every effort to switch them to oral regimen. So patients, only patients who we know, they've been in and out, we know their dose, that we switch them on day of discharge. The switch should be 24 hours before. So if we have switched them to an oral regimen, and 24 hours later, on that oral regimen, they are losing weight, we know the trajectory that they're going to continue to lose, those I feel very comfortable sending them out, even if they're still 10 pounds above their dry weight, because I, I establish an oral regimen that's working for them. So that's one. The other, um, we have done, and we do it quite often, uh, we give IV, um, IV Lasix in the clinic. So if we can get the patient to be seen in the discharge clinic in three, four days and get another, another dose of IV, that's, uh, that's a patient I'm comfortable sending. Those are the patients who are established and reliable, and they're going to show up. And third, we have now um, a clinical trial going on uh, with a sub-Q uh, furosemide. It's not yet standard of care, but we are a center for that. So, uh, and feel free to call us with those patients. So if you identify a patient who diuresed well, but yes, yes, they still need about two, two, one to two days more of IV, but they're doing well symptomatically, they're doing well, they can go home. Those are the patients we can enroll them in that. So basically, it's a, it's a randomized trial to either, with a flip of coin, you either stay in the hospital for those extra two days and get to your dry weight, or get discharged if you are randomized to the pump. So it's a, it's a fixed dose of IV furosemide, sub-Q, like the insulin pump. They go home with the device and they inject themselves, and we, they up to one week. And then we see them in the clinic, and we have randomized 
a handful of patients so far, and those uh, they did well. The ones who went home with a the pump, they did diuresis well. So that that's another uh, venue. So if that it's going to take another year or two, but if that proven to be useful, that's going to cut down on hospitalization a lot. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, as effective as how you, how you, what you do with the data that you get out of it. So, cardio, are you guys familiar with cardio mounts? Any, anyone knows what it is? Yeah. So it's basically um, a small uh, device that we implant. It's a catheter implanted in the pulmonary artery. During the right heart cath, you go in to the left pulmonary artery and you just implant it there. So what it does, and then you can measure the, uh, the, the pressure. It transmits the data into the uh, receiver that the patient goes home with. It's like a pillow that they sit on, and, and uh, wirelessly it comes to us. It comes to a website where we can log in and look at it. Uh, so basically what it does, it's continuous measurement of the pulmonary artery pressure. So we know that in the absence of pulmonary vascular hypertension, uh, your diastolic uh, PA pressure correlates with your left atrial pressure or your wedge pressure. So you're indirectly measuring the left-sided filling pressures all the time. So what the advantage of it is that you can see the, the pressures rising two or three days before the patient starts adding pillows behind his back or can't walk or you know, so it precedes the symptoms by two, three days, which allows you that time uh, to, to intervene. But if you don't intervene, the patient can end up in the hospital. So, so what we do, we have our um, heart care nurse log on the website and look at those patients every day. And any, any rise or trend that's going up is a phone call to the patient. And sometimes, you know, they maybe had fries for dinner the night before. And, you know, all it takes is an extra dose of Lasix. And, Sometimes we bring them in and see them in the hospital, give them IV, sorry, in the clinic and give them IV Lasix. So we, we do a lot in, to, to reduce, reduce. So what uh, the champion trial that for this cardio mouse, uh, what it showed is, is redu a significant reduction in hospitalization in those patients. So it is um, not all insurance companies pay for it yet, but uh, in those patients who qualify, we, we, we have been implanting those devices. questions. Well, thank you guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, David.